right, so now let's actually solve this problem. And that is, remember, what we were really working with were uh, two trust members that uh, had, were identical here, 7.5 feet, 7.5 feet. They had a 50 kip applied load here uh, in the middle. Right? And we have already looked at the global equations of equilibrium when we assembled those uh, stiffness, that stiffness matrix. That is that from the global perspective, then KD equals Q. Right now, again, this is a series of equations where the unknowns are the member end displacements. And we've chosen to model the system by at only three locations that we've got our degree of freedom one here at the left, degree of freedom two in the middle, and degree of freedom three at the end. And of course that does mean, given the support conditions, that we know that D1 is equal to zero and that D3 is equal to zero, but D2 is not known. Likewise, what we know is that Q2 is equal to a positive 50 kips. It's a nodal applied force. We don't know what Q3 is, and we don't know what Q1 is. These are the reactions. Right? So we can't specify both the applied nodal force and the uh, nodal displacement at once. Those are ones of support and ones free um, and from a displacement perspective. Right now from the numerical standpoint here then of what we've got, notice too that let's expand this out in its all its grand glory Right, so we've got here a system with three degrees of freedom. So that's a three by one, and the nodal displace or uh, force nodal force vector is three by one, and the stiffness matrix then is three by three. We know that from our previous work that this is 966.6 repeating kips per inch, and we had a one here, a minus one, zero minus one, a two, minus one, and then zero, minus one, and one again. And that then, in our case, then, all right, so we don't know D2, but we do know that D1 and D3 are zero. And so, then that will equal a nodal, nodal force vector where we don't know Q1, we don't know Q3, but we do know that Q2, the applied force, is 50 kips. And so in this specific case, we have a sim very simple uh, numerical processing here to solve for our unknown, remaining unknown displacement that if we look at this, second equilibrium equation, then we would have that. We're going to write out, even though some th terms in here are very obvious, we're going to go ahead and write out some things. And that is we've got from the second equation, we have 966.6 times minus 1 times 0 plus 2 times the 966.6 times D2 and then uh, we'll have plus 966.6 times minus 1 times 0 has to equal our 50 kips. Remember we've got kips per inch as the units here and of course we've got some terms that go away, simplify things out, and our D2 then would be 50 divided by 2 divided by 966.6666 repeating, and we get a displacement then, kips over kips per inch, that means our D2 would be equal to a positive 
0 0.026 inches. And the positive indicates to us to the right. Okay, and that should is as would be expected. Um, that's interesting. From that, then note we could go back to our member stiffness matrix now that we know all of the displacements, and we can put those in to the uh, member view, and we can figure out now what the member and forces are that go along with that um, that member, right? Generically, notice that what we're really going to do is, in some sense, invert the stiffness matrix, et cetera, et cetera, except for we do need to be a little bit more careful in how we uh, think about all that. And that is that the some of these degrees of freedom were free, and some of them were not. They were restrained. They were our supports. And so <clears throat> notice here, if we... Let's let QF represent the nodal forces at the free degrees of freedom. We'll let Q sub S equal the nodal forces at the support. And then likewise, DF would be the displacements at the free degree of degrees of freedom, and DS would be the displacements at the supports. Now, generally, of course, you probably think of those as being zero, but we could impose them as support movements. Then they're a known value, but non-zero. Or if they were attached to an elastic foundation, we can handle that uh, in there as well, associated with these. Now, when we do it this way, then we can partition up this whole system and rearrange rows and columns such that we could rewrite this general expression of KD equals Q into something that looks like following. And reorganizing the rows, reorganizing the columns. We can partition up things such that we could put all of the free degrees of freedom up on the top, and we could put all the support ones here. Now, globally, the way we've set things up, for us, that would be, this would be a D or D2, and this would be a D1 and a D3. So this would be a one by one. Oh, here, let's do that. Let's write that down. This is going to turn out to be a one by one, and this is going to be turn out to be a two by one in this specific instance. Right? And likewise, then for the forces, we'd have the nodal forces that are associated with the free degrees of freedom. And then we'd have the reaction forces that are associated with the supports. And you get this. And of course, again, in this case, that would be a one by one, and that would be a two by one. Right? Now, likewise, we're going to make a partition in the global structural stiffness matrix and we'll have up here in the upper left we're going to have our KFF the structural stiffness that's associated with only the free degrees of freedom right and then we would have KFR down here KRF in the lower left and K R, R, really, that should be an S, shouldn't it, for supports. Some people use the R I just did by mistake because it stands R for restrained or S for supports. Either one uh, works. And notice what you end up with here. That matrix manipulation-wise, this has to be a 1 by 1. This has to be a 1 by 2. This is a 2 by 1 and a 2 by 2. 
and note how this is going to work out here that KFF times DF is got to equal to QF and in this case we it's just a simple one equation 1 by 1 times a 1 uh, by 1 what did I do there? Well, what I did was I sort of dropped something out. I already knew that that KFS was going to have some zeros in it. You know, or I'm sorry, they don't have it does have some zeros, but but DS were all zeros. So when I multiply those two through, let's be more complete here, and let's just write that all the way out so you see it. KFF times DF plus then KFS times DS has to be equal then <clears throat> this times that plus that times that has to equal that there's your QF right and since these are zero that's why that all went away and we just had those two which is what I, I was doing over here and so that does mean that DF is going to be equal to the inverse of KFF times QF that's how your uh, computer program is really solving these things right and then you can come back to here and we've got that KSF times DF plus KSF SS times DS is going to be equal to QS right well again keep in mind what was going on here these were the applied nodal forces and QS are the reactions and since we know what DS are they're generally going to be zero they're not always but generally going to be uh, zero but if they were non-zero then there'd be a known quantity here and QF minus this whole stuff and then we would invert etc etc substitute in if as is the case here that zero then in this special situation the reactions are just simply going to be this KSF times DF uh, vector and since we just found out what the DF is you could actually substitute this directly in where you go there's your matrix manipulation for all of these various um, quantities